The two Middle Eastern types, Proto-Semitic Afrasan haplogroup E versus Irano-Caucasian Armenoid haplogroup J. Two Middle Eastern types. But before we get too deep into the video, first I want to tell you guys about my social media platforms. So I have a Clubhouse account, and we can actually talk to one another on it. I also host Clubhouse Rooms every now and then, where I might talk about history and genetics of the Middle East and Africa. I have a Twitter page, a Facebook account, and a Facebook page, as well as a Instagram, all titled The Hebrew of Israel. And what I typically do on these platforms is post upcoming videos, as well as um, slides for my presentations and so just be on the lookout for all of that on my social media platforms and if you want to support me financially for the channel you can look at my patreon as well as my paypal and my gofundme and with all of that out of the way let's begin with the video if haplogroup j are ancient indo-europeans and caucasian then how is haplogroup J Semitic today? In order to answer this question, we'll need to go back to the beginning of the spread of haplogroup J into Semitic territory. Remember the Quora Araxis culture and their expansion? This paper deals with that. The end of the Quora Araxis culture as seen from Nadir Tip-Isi in Iran, Azerbaijan. And it reads, by the late 4th to early 3rd millennium BCE, Quora Araxis, early Transcaucasian material culture, spread from the Southern Caucasus throughout much of Southwestern Asia. The Quora Araxis settlements declined and ultimately disappeared in almost all the regions in Southwest Asia around the mid middle of the third millennium BCE. In this field report, we argue that the Quora Araxis culture in the Western Caspian lateral plain ended abruptly and possibly violently. To demonstrate this, we review the current hypothesis about the end of the core Araxis culture and the, and the use results from excavations at Nadir Tepisi in Iranian Azerbaijan. The core Araxis settlements declined and ultimately disappeared in almost all regions of southwestern Asia around the middle of the third millennium BCE. There are two prominent theories explaining the end of the core or axis culture. The first highlights the role of environmental factors in the, in the abandonment of the core or axis settlements. The second theory stresses the role of migration and the arrival of new groups of people into the region. This includes a large reduction in the number of settlements and increase in burial sites, the appearance of collective burials and impressive royal kurgans, increased mobility and changes in Semitic traditions. In addition, there is a clear increase in metalwork, especially in the gold and silver attested mostly in rich burials. To some scholars, all these transformations suggest the arrival of new groups of people with a new lifestyle based on transhumanist pastoralism. The test trenches at Natdir Tepisi suggest that the Quora Araxis occupation ended abruptly in the mid third in the mid third millennium BCE, and that the site was then occupied or visited by a new group of people with new cultural traditions. Evidence for a significant destruction followed by the sharp 
discontinuity in the material culture could represent a violent termination of the core Araxis occupation at Nadir Tispi. From a broad perspective, the abrupt and possible violent end of the core Araxis occupation at Nadir Tibiski to, together with the sudden disappearance of the core Araxis settlements and the scarcity of post core Araxis sites in the Mugham Steep may indicate that this change that these changes were part of a larger phenomenon. On the other hand, Coho hypothesizes the possibility of a push-pull process in which new groups of people with wheeled chariots and ox-pulled wagons gradually moved from the steep of the north into the southern Caucasus and the core Araxis communities subsequently moved further south. Coho also reminds us of the evidence of increased militarism from the early and the late Bronze Age that is reflected in more fortified sites, new weaponry, and an iconography of war as seen on the Peresheb Cup. Koho argues that while the number of core Araxis settlements decreased in the Southern Caucasus, archaeological research indicates that the core Araxis culture spread to Western Iran in the Zagros region and to the Levant. In Koho's view, as new groups of people moved in, the core Araxis communities abandoned the Southern Caucasus and moved further south where, they, where some of them already resided. Others associate the culture of the post core Araxis period, especially at Trial Eti culture, with movement of people from the Near East, especially the expansion of the Hurrian tribes. The core Araxis culture may have disappeared in various ways. The transition to the post core Araxis time may not be explained by a single model. Different core Araxis settlements may have ended differently. At Koden Shanar, the core Araxis culture ended around the middle of the 3rd millennium BCE. The evidence from Koden Shanar may point to a nonviolent end or a planned abandonment of the site. As the excavations at Nadir Tepisi and other sites show the demise of the core Araxis culture remains enigmatic. While different core Araxis settlements may have ended in different ways, it is remarkable that the culture seems to have disappeared at about the same time over a very extend at a very extensive area. Although the ends of core Araxis settlements do not fits a uniform pattern. They apparently were part of a large-scale phenomenon. So here's the core axis culture, as we all know, in the Southern Caucasus, and then it begins to spread further south into the Near East until it gets all the way into the Middle East. So let me just make that fast for you all to see. So boom, boom, boom. So we have this group of Caucasian peoples, uh, proto-Caucasians from the core Araxis culture coming in to the Middle East. So the people of the core Araxis cultures began to spread south due to multiple reasons, from climate change to warfare to abandonment of sites and etc. The core Araxis people are believed to have carried haplogroup J. The descendants or tribes of core Araxis people were Hurrians and Caucasians. It would seem uh, as though that the Hurrians, when they migrated south, that other Caucasian peoples stayed further north. Basically, there was a split between two Caucasian groups. This is from EUpedia, Middle East Regional DNA Project, and it reads, the, the Caucasus was the birthplace of bronze metallurgy. The Two great bronze, 
the two great Bronze Age cultures that steamed from it, the Mayakop Yamnaya and Koraxis cultures, expanded far and wide and reshaped the genetic landscape of Western Eurasia. Southern Caucasians or South Caucasians would have belonged to Y haplogroups J1 and J2, later associated with the Cora or Axis culture. Now this is from Puru Uratrian from the le from the lexical statistical point of view, and it reads the Huru Uratrian linguistic family cons consists of two closely related languages, Hurian with several dialects and Uratrian. Despite the chronological distance between the attested Hurian and Uratrian, it seems clear that the latter is not a direct descendant of the former, but the two languages represent two separate branches of a common proto-language, proto huru Uratrian. For the pre-literate period, it is natural to associate the huru Uratrian people with the poor Araxis culture, early Transcaucasian uh, archaeological culture. So when you think of huru Uratrian, think of the poor Araxis culture. When you think of Hurrians and Uratrians, think of the poor Araxis culture. This is where these people come from. This is from Encyclopedia of Indo-European Culture in the period immediately prior to the emergence of the Hurrians in the northern area of their distribution, uh, in the northern area of their distribution was occupied by the Koro Araxis culture, circa 3,400 through 2,500 BC. The distribution of Koro Araxis sites would encompass the territory of the Ito and Uratrians, as well as the northern part of the Hurrians. It is often presumed that the Koro-Araxis culture is an archaeological reflection of the Hurrians. This is from How Eurasia Was Born. The Northeast Caucasian language family seems to show clear links to ancient eastern Anatolia as most subclades of J1-Z1842 TMRCA's 4300 BCE can be linked to the Armenian highlands in present-day Azerbaijan, precisely fitting the exact location of the Koro Araxis culture, 3400 BCE through 2000 BCE. Three subclades of it, J1-ZS3042 TMRCA's 3500 BCE, J1-ZS5658 TMRCA's 2800 BCE, J1 ZS 2872 2800 BCE and J1 Y 5353 TMRCA is 2500 BCE are widespread among Northeast Caucasian groups. Suggests Northeast Caucasian languages to have originated from the Core Araxis culture, as ancient J1 subclades also seem to have been present in the ancient Levant as well. This supports the existence of a Alduin language family linking Hurrian to Northeast Caucasian. And also think of Hurrians as being Northeast Caucasian people. This is why I said earlier, uh, a few minutes ago, that it was seen that the Hurrians were a branch of Caucasians that came into the Middle East, but another branch of Caucasians stayed uh, in the Caucasus. So here is, again, the early Transcaucasian culture here, here, also known as the Core Araxis culture, and a group of them will come into the Middle East, and the rest will stay in the Caucasus. And here's a map just detailing the Huru-Uratrian language, which is in brown, as well as other Caucasian languages like Hattic, which eventually the Hittites will conquer, and uh, various other Caucasian languages. So, one group believed to possibly be a, H a Hurrian tribe are the Gutians. However, some believe that Gutians are Indo-Europeans. Either way, there is a theory that the Gutians are Hurrians. Now, some would even say that Gutians are the ancestors of the Kurds or the Kurdish people. Genetically speaking, Kurds could be descendants of Hurrians. 
So in a roundabout way, Gutians could be a branch of Horians, or a mixture of Horians and Indo-Europeans, just like the Kurds. Reading down below, right here, only going to read the first line. The numerous clans of the Horians, and that's how I have to think of Horians, by the way, they're different clans. The numerous clans of the Horians, such as the Gutis, and then skip down here, the Kurti, Proto-Kurds. So these are just the two clans we're going to focus on, the Gutians and the Kurti. So this is from the Middle East Reader, and it reads, Yet another group of Kurds whose existence can be traced to the mid-third millennium BCE were the Guti, whose kingdom corresponds with the part of Kurdistan currently held by Iraq and who were one of the most important kingdoms of the ancient East, of the ancient civilized East. Now this is a genetic paper dealing with the Kurds uh, being related to the Hurrians. This is from Genetic HLA Study of Kurds in Iraq, Iran, and Tbilisi, Caucasus, Georgia, Relatedness and Medical Implications. And I'm going to read what is in yellow right here. And it reads, Hurrians, whose language was Caucasian and not Indo-European, may be Kurds' ancient genetic background, reviewed in, and then it gives the references. And then I'm going to read this section right here, dealing with the Kurds' relations to people in Anatolia. And it reads, HLA uh, genetic similarities have been reported between Turks whose genes belong to old Anatolian stock and Kurds. Kurds and Turks speak, diff speak languages that are included in different families. However, Kurd HLA genetic studies include them in Mediterranean stock together with Turks. Now I'm going to skip down right here to the next relevant portion. Also, Iranian populations are close to Kurds. So that's the Indo-European branch that the uh, Kurds have, which is Iranian. So now we're going to read from Encyclopedia of the Peoples of Africa and the Middle East. And it reads, I'm going to actually start down here in yellow. Sumerian writings dating to around 3000 BCE refer to the land of Kurda or Korda and the people living there as the Kordushi and the Guti and other variants. These are thought to be the earliest written references to the to the peoples who would become known as Kurds. Assyrian records from this period describe these people as the Korda or Kurda around 1000 BCE. The term Kurd first appears in Assyrian records with reference to those people, also called Korti or Kortia, a living south of Lake Van in present-day Turkey. The Hurrians are so ubiquitous that many Indo-Iranian and Indo-European peoples are believed to have substantive Hurrian contributions in their ethnogenesis. For example, the Kurds consider themselves and their culture as the descendants of the Hurrians. Uh, and their civilization, despite linguistic unification. And that was from the book, The Chechens. So here is Kurdish inhabited area, which perfectly overlaps with ancient peoples and kingdoms, such as the Mitanni, the Hurrians, the, the um, Huratrians, ancient Kurda, and the Kurti, and the Gutis. So the Kurds could descend from basically these populations with an Iranian influence as well. So remember, Gutians were the group that destroyed the Akkadian Empire. Now, keeping everything in mind, Gutians are perhaps a mixture of Hurrians and Iranian migrants that came into Mesopotamia that over the years destroyed Akkad. What we see genetically and biologically is that this northern invaders had Iranian DNA and they had an arminoid phenotype. This is from ancient 
Egypt and the Near East, and it reads, During the last years of the Akkadian Empire, there were many incursions by fierce tribesmen from the southeast, carrying out hit-and-run raids. These intruders were the Gutsians, one of many peoples living in the Zargos Mountains. These raiders plundered the rich cities of Mesopotamian plain and were always long gone before any army could arrive to confront them. The Gutians pillaged all over the Akkadian Empire, although they occupied only a few remote areas. Finally, they destroyed Akkad itself. This is from a report on the human remains found at Kish. So we just read about the Gutians destroying Akkad. Now we're going to deal with their phenotype. But it is possible that even in this period, the Arminoids of the north were already beginning to infiltrate into northern Sumer. It must be remembered that soon after the fall of the Semitic Empire of Akkad, the entire land of Sumer and Akkad was ruled for over a century by the Gutians from the north between the upper and lower Zeb rivers. The valuable results obtained by the authors of this paper confirm what the historians had assumed in regard to the early mixture of Sumerians and Semites at Kish, the oldest capital of Sumer, and the greatest metropolitan of the north, later known as Akkad. Dr. Buxton finds an increasing mixture of the round-headed arminoid type. This must be explained as an infiltration from Syria and the Hittite region if they are not normal variants. So it mentioned the Hittite type connecting it with the Arminoid. So this is from contributions to the uh, anthropology of Iran. The so-called Arminoid type is defined by Hayden under the Eurasiatic bro uh, Brachycephals as Ar Anatolian Armenian, dark hair, tawny white skin, medium stature, very brachiocephalic, a prominent aquiline nose, which means a hooked nose, with a depressed tip, and large wings is very characteristic. Scattered in Anatolia, Armenia, the ancient Hittites were typical members of this race. So that's, when you think of a Gutsian, when you think of a Hurian, um, think of an Arminoid phenotype, if you want to picture in your mind the, these people, these ancient people. So this is a Hittite. You know, see right here, here are Kurds, and Kurds are believed to be a branch of Horians. Also, it's believed that Kurds may be descendants of Gutians. So this is a good example of what an ancient Gutian could have looked like, a male and female. Same thing with the Ar Armenians, uh, from where the Arminoid uh, terminology comes from. Uh, Armenians are another good example for, let's say, a Hittite, what a Hittite may have looked like uh, in the ancient world and other uh, Caucasian and uh, Indo-European peoples as well. And so this is from continu continuity and admixture in the last five millennia of Levantine history from ancient Canaan, Canaanite and present-day Lebanese genome sequences. We're going to read the section that deals with the collapse of the Akkadian Empire from a, a modern perspective. And it reads in yellow, the, Ak the Akkadian collapse is argued to have been the result of a widespread edification event around 4,200 years ago, possibly caused by a volcanic eruption. Archaeological evidence in this period documents large-scale influxes of refugees from northern Mesopotamia towards the south where cities and villages became overpopulated. So you see a lot of influ influx of people. Further sampling of ancient DNA from northern Syria and Iraq may reveal if these migrants carried the Iranian calcolithic related ancestry we observe in Bronze Age, Sidon, and Jordan. So we see that Akkad fell when there's a lot of people from the northern Mesopotamia coming south and it became overpopulated and such. And they said that maybe future sampling would Tell us if these people had Iranian DNA that were coming in. And luckily enough, uh, we did have future sampling that said it. But as we see that these northern invaders, they likely would have had half of J from everything that we've covered, dealing with the Gutians being connected to the Hurrians and the Hurrians being connected to the Core Araxis, and the Core Araxis having 
haplogroup group J, and the Hurrians also having haplogroup group J, and then this by, you know, by a roundabout way would mean that the Gutians also ethnically would have been connected to all these peoples coming from the north into the south. All these Koraxis tribes or Hurrian tribes that were pushing the way further south. Now, when the Gutians, who are a mixture of Hurrians and Iranians, destroy the Cod, this is when we see Haplogroup J enter the Levant in the early Bronze Age. This also is when we start to see the Koraxis culture appear in the Levant with the Kerbek Kerik wire culture. Furthermore, Hurrians were expanding in this time period as well, and the Hurrians are descendants of the Koraxis culture. Therefore, uh, you know, therefore, it was the Hurrians that likely introduced the Kerbek wire culture, and it was you know, also likely that the Hurrians introduced Haplogroup J into the region. And keep in mind, when Haplogroup J came into the region creating the Kerbek Kerbek wire culture, that is not a somatic culture. Uh, that is a Caucasian culture. So J is not associated with ancient Semitic culture yet. It's Caucasian culture that's coming into the Middle East. There's these archaeologists specifically call this Caucasian culture, not Semitic culture. So, reading from the top, we sought we next sought to uh, estimate the time when the Iranian ancestry penetrated the Levant. The most significant result was for a mixture of Levant Neolithic and Iranian Chalcolithic around 181 plus or minus 54 years ago or 5,000 plus or minus 1,500 years ago, assuming a generation time of 28 years. The admixture time also overlaps with the rise and fall of the Akkadian Empire, which, which controlled the region from Iran to the Levant between 4.4 and 4.2 KYA. The Akkadian collapse is argued to have been the result of a widespread airification event around 4,200 years ago, possibly caused by volcanic eruption. Archaeological evidence in this period documents large-scale influxes of refugees from northern Mesopotamia towards the south, where cities and villages became overpopulated. Future sampling of ancient DNA from northern Syria and Iraq may reveal if these migrants carried Iranian calculistic related ancestry we observe in Bronze Age, Sidon, and Jordan. So keep in mind, it's saying these migrants, they're wondering if these migrants carried Iranian calculistic ancestry. So this paper, which came out in 2021, the genomic history of the Middle East, reads, we have we found an ancestry related to ancient Iranians that is ubiquitous today in all Middle Easterners. So we got the answer to that question, that the Middle Easterners are in fact just a sub-branch of Iranians. Uh, po pre previous studies showed that this ancestry was not uh, present in the Levant during the Neolithic period, but appeared in the Bronze Age, where 50% of the local ancestry was replaced by a population carrying ancient Iranian-related ancestry. So the ancestry of the original Le Levantine uh, population was replaced in that original population. As I keep re reiterating, it was Semitic because that is where Semites came from. This population potentially introduced the Y chromosome half of the J1 into the region. So this Iranian ancestry is also seems to be connected to half of the group J1. So this is why I say J1 seems to have a very strong association with Caucasian and Iranian types uh, when it comes to uh, DNA. And again, it gave rise to the later Kerbek Kerik wire culture found in Syria and Canaan after the fall of the Akkadian Empire, reading down here what's in yellow. This is talking about the core Araxis culture. It gave rise to the later Kerbek Kerik wire culture found in Syria and Canaan after the fall of the Akkadian Empire. It's after the fall of Akkad that this Caucasian culture pops up in Syria and Canaan. But this also goes to show you that it is not Semitic culture. The collapse of the Akkadian Empire saw the arrival of peoples using Kerbek Kerik wire pottery uh, coming originally from the Zargos Mountains. That's the exact area where the Gutians also came from east of the Tigris. It is suspected by some that this event marked the arrival in Syria and Palestine of the Hurrian of the Hurrians. 
people later known in the biblical tradition, possibly as the Horites. So this is why I say that the Kerbet Kerbet culture is connected to the Horians. When the Horians entered Syria and Palestine, they brought that Caucasian culture because, as we read earlier, Horians are believed to be descendants of the Koraxis culture. So this makes sense. And this also means that when it comes to half of the J, that it is not really Semitic in origin. Yes, you have Semitic people, uh, Semitic speakers today who have half of the J, but it would seem like that when J entered the Levant and entered the Levant with Caucasian peoples, with Caucasian culture, Hurrians in the Kerbet Kerbet wire pottery. So, this is from World History Encyclopedia of the Hurrians. When the kingdom of Akkad fell in 2190 BCE, the Hurrians and others exploited the consequent power vacuum in Mesopotamia. So again, when Akkad fell, the Hurrians saw an opportunity. And this is from Ancient DNA from Calcolithic Israel, reveals the role of population mixture in cultural transformation, and it reads, These findings contrast with both earlier Neolithic and Epipaleolithic Levantine populations, which were dominated by half the group E, and later Bronze Age individuals, all of whom belong to half the group J. This is when those Hurrians and Caucasian groups started to come into the Levant. This is from Continuity and a Mixture in the Last Five Millennia of Levantine History from Ancient Canaanite and Present-day Lebanese Genome Synthesis and Reads. We compiled frequencies of Y chromosome haplogroups in this geographical area and their changes over time in a data set of ancient and modern Levantine populations. And note, Similarly to uh, and notes, similarly to Lazarus, uh, you know, study that haplogroup J was absent in all Natufian and Neolithic Levant male individuals examined thus far, but emerged during the Bronze Age in Lebanon and Jordan, along with ancestry related to Iranian Calcolithic DNA. So. J was not present in the Natufians or Neol Neolithic Levant people, which, you know, it's believed that Natufians and Neolithic Levantines are the ancestors of Semites, so J wasn't present. But also, J emerged in the Bronze Age, and Iranian Chalcolithic DNA is attached to it. So, again, we know that these J markers had this Iranian component, and it is this Iranian component that collapse the Akkadian Empire. So again, this is a, a, a non-Semitic population coming into Semitic territory and uh, even collapsing Semitic uh, civilizations like Akkad. So, uh, so as explained in the past, this is further evidence that Haplogroup J is not Semitic in origin because Haplogroup J entered the Levant when Semitic languages were already being spoken for centuries. After all, it was people with half of J carrying Iranian DNA and speaking non-Semitic languages that collapsed the Semitic Empire of Akkad in Mesopotamia and then spread southwards. So half of the group J literally passed Semitic people as they went deeper into Semitic lands. That evidence alone would show that half of J is not Semitic in origin. This is from Bayesian, followed genetic analysis of Semitic languages, identifies an early Bronze Age origin of Semitic in the Near East. And it reads, reading uh, what's in yellow, by the way, these results indicate that the ancestor of all Semitic languages in our data set was being spoken in the Near East no earlier, earlier than approximately 7,400 YBP after having diverged from Afro-Asiatic in Africa. And then down below it just reads, the discovery of such early Semitic languages could increase estimates of the age of Semitic and alter its geographical origin if these early Semitic languages were found in Africa rather than in the Middle East. And it reads, we use Bayesian 
Bayesian phylogenetic methods to elucidate the relationships and divergence dates of Semitic languages, which we then related to epigraphic and archaeological records to produce a comprehensive apophysis of Semitic languages and dispersals after the divergence of ancestral Semitic from Afro-Asiatic in Africa. We estimate that Semitic had an early Bronze Age origin in the Levant, followed by an expansion of Akkadian into Mesopotamia. So, this is from how Eurasia was born. The most plausible candidates for Semitic remigration in the Fertile Crescent with TMRCAs fitting the arrival of the Akkadians and other early Semitic peoples are certain subclades of both E-V22 and E-V12 with, with relatively early TMRCAs present in the Middle East could be candidates for such remigration, such as E-FGC14382, TMRCAs 2200 BCE, and E-V3262, TMRCAs 2600 BCE. So, Copy group E coming out of the Levant, just like Semitic languages, like early Semites and Akkadians coming out of the Levant into Mesopotamia, which fits along with the model that we just read. So let's just give a basic breakdown when it comes to the timeline of everything. So 3750 BC, origin of Proto-Semitic and Levant. 2334 to 2154 BC was when the Akkadian Empire was established in Mesopotamia. Then 2154 BC was the fall of Akkad by Gutians, who were, you know, Hurrians slash Iranian group, mixed group. Then, you know, after Akkad fell, the Kerbek Karakwar Caucasian culture appears in the Levant, and then the Hurrians migrate. Uh, beyond Mesopotamia starts to begin. And then Irano Caucasian ancestry and half of the J appears in the Levant. So that's sort of the timeline that we have. And we'll go deeper into this timeline as well to uh, establish everything a little bit even more coherently. But the reason why it's important for half of J to be Semitic in origin is because Proto Semitic was already being spoken in the Levant before half of J arrived centuries later. But Hapka Group E was present in the Levant when Proto-Semitic existed. It was Hapka Group J that collapsed Akkad, a Akkadian a Mesopotamian Semitic civilization. And only after Semites fell did Hapka Group J migrate further southwards. Then Hapka Group J migrated into the Levant. Furthermore, haplogroup J cannot be Semitic in origin because it's pushing against the migration of actual Semites. Basically, haplogroup J is coming from the opposite direction in which Semites originated. Haplogroup J is going north to south, whereas Semites were going south to north. Furthermore, haplogroup J passed Semitic city-states as it was entering the Levant. If Hurrians are haplogroup J carriers, then remember, Hurrian is non-Semitic. But this is why E is considered proto-Semitic. E-M34 is, mo is the main Middle Eastern variety of EMB1B and is thought to have arrived with the proto-Semitic people in the late copper to early Bronze Age. That's from EUpedia, haplogroup EMB1B. In this book, the history of ancient Palestine reads, among the invaders of Syria during the 2nd millennium BCE were the Hurrians, a non-Semitic people, again, a non-Semitic people, which as time went by, created one of the most powerful states in the Near East, namely the Mitanni Kingdom. Now, to answer our question, our long-awaited question, uh, how or why are people with half the J today Semitic speakers, if in ancient times, J was associated with Hurrians and Iranians and Caucasians. The simple answer is this, is that ancient haplogroup J males adopted Semitic languages from haplogroup E Semites. 
this is something that has long been proven. This is from half the group J1. It's definitely not Semitic from half the groups.org and it reads Haplogroup J1 is not is not a Semitic haplogroup in origin. However, genetically, we can't call this haplogroup Semitic. Again, however, genetically, we can't call this haplogroup Semitic because Semitic people mainly have the FGC11 uh, lineage of this haplogroup in those areas. As Arabic society is mainly based on a unique cluster of J1 haplogroup FGC11, it is wrong to call all people with with J1 as Semitic. In this sense, we can't we can't we cannot attribute haplogroup J1 to Semitic origin. In fact, it is apparent that there are that there are various clusters of J1 among Caucasian, European, and South Central Asian people, which we covered <laughs> quite extensively, uh, especially in Caucasus. Caucasus. J1 seems in high or medium amounts among various ethnic groups, such as, I'm going to read just some of these, the Kubachis, the Lesguians, the Avars, the Dargians, the Sarsians, the Chechnyans, like you mentioned the Chechens, the Bulgars, uh, the Azerbaijanis, Turks. All these people speak various languages which are bound up with Northeast Caucasian languages, Northwest Caucasian languages, and Turkic languages. And people and European people having J1 also speak Indo-European languages rather than Semitic. So basically you have Really, you have more people with uh, more more people with half group J speaking non-Semitic Caucasian or European languages than Semitic. That's basically what this paper is saying. Blue bar means J1 FGC11, which is a unique lineage among Arabs. On the other hand, the other lineages would seem among Europeans, Caucasians, and Turks rather than Arabs. This means J1 isn't of Semitic origin. So you see this blue right here? This blue is the FGC11 uh, that's seen in Arabs, as they said, or in certain Middle Eastern populations. And this one branch, this one single branch of J is in the Middle East. But then you have all these diverse branches of J throughout uh, Europe and uh, other parts of Eurasia. Here are all the other colors and other sub-branches. So basically, this is part of the reason why J doesn't seem to be Semitic in origin because you really only have one J type in, um, in the Middle East. And then all the other diverse lineages are outside of the Middle East. So continuing with the study, it is also known that the most that the mostly seen haplogroups in Afroasiatic speakers is the lineage of E1B, such as E, such as V12, V32, and M81. E1B is one of the most common uh, haplogroups in Semitic people in the Levant and Mesopotamia. In the meantime, E-V12 seems to be a part of Nile Basin and Arabia, and E-M81 is related to Northwest Africa. Based on the Arab genealogical tradition, the Adonites are Arabized Arabs, whereas the Quatanite tribes are thought to be pure Arabs, the local people of Arabia. Today, in genetic projects, we see that most of people from Quatani tribes are usually related to the to the lineage of, lineages of E1B1, whereas Adonites are mostly related to half the group J1, and we have a video uh, detailing that as well. Check out my Jock Tonight videos. The main source of Afroasiatic languages are the lineages of E1B1, such as M2, which is an E1B1A, uh, V12, which is another E1B1B, V32, U1774, V22, etc., which spread, which spread uh, the Levant during the early period 
of ancient Egypt and towards Mesopotamia in the east. Semitic languages such as Hebrew, Arabic, and Amharic are characterized under the Afro-Asiatic language family. This means that Arabic and Hebrew languages derive from the same language with Berber, Chadic, Cushitic, Egyptian, Amharic, and Omotic languages of Afro-Asiatic language family in North Africa. Today, we see that the most Today we see that the most of Afro-Asiatic people are of E1B1B haplogroup, especially the lineages of V12, V32, M81, and we see a great variety of E1B lineages among both Semitic and Afro-Asiatic people, whereas only FGC11 lineage of J1 is present among Afro-Asiatic Semitic people. And it is also impossible to see J1 haplogroup among se several Afroasiatic people, such as uh, Berbers, etc. According to the theory, Afroasiatic languages spread to Asia via E1B haplogroup, not J1 haplogroup. Again, according to the theory, Afroasiatic languages spread to Asia via E1B haplogroup, not J1 haplogroup. It is historically known that a elite that a ruling elite class of Afro-Asiatic people, Akkadians, Assyrians, etc., also invaded the northern, the north of Mesopotamia and brought their Afro-Asiatic languages to the central and northern parts of Mesopotamia during the period of the Akkadians and Babylonians. The elite dominance model of E1B1 might be supposed for Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians. In this sense, it might be theorized that Sumerian was the main language of the ancient Mesopotamians before Afroasiatic E1B overwhelmed Mesopotamia elite dominance model. In this paper, dealing with a similar thing as that, as the previous one we read, it's called Genetics, Egypt, and History, Interpreting the Geographical Patterns of Y Chromosome Variation, and it reads, it can be postulated that select M35 carriers, M35 is capital B, speakers from Africa of a stage of ancestral Semitic, pre-proto-Semitic, entered the Near East, where indigenous peoples adopted it and via ongoing language shift and population growth eventually became numerably greater than the original speakers of the ancestors. So basically they're saying that capital group E was the ancestral Semitic peoples, but other peoples adopted Semitic from half the group E, and these other peoples uh, genetically became larger and greater than the original E speakers of Semitic, and then they eventually just overwhelmed them through population shift. What kind of makes you think about what happened with the Iranians coming into the Levant and population replacement occurred there Kind of, kind of reminds me of that. This is from In Hot Pursuit of Language and Prehistory, and it reads, The presence of Semitic in the Near East might be explained as follows. Early pre-proto-Semitic speakers would have migrated into Syria palestine before the Neolithic being taken by their M35 bearers, specifically M35-78, and adopted by populations bearing M89. Lineages. So again, this uh, book also says basically the same thing. Uh, the uh, original Semitic populations were half of group E, but other people adopted half of group E who were part of the M89 lineages. They adopted the language of half of group E via the Semitic tongue, should I say. So by the way, FM89 is basically 90% of, uh, of the uh, male paternal lineages outside of Africa. It also includes haplogroup J as part of this lineage. Uh, haplogroup IJ is a human Y chromosome DNA haplogroup and intermediate descendant of haplogroup IJK, also known as F-L15. And so it's part of that FM89 lineage that would have adopted Semitic from haplogroup E. So in all actuality, the only haplogroup among all the branches of Y chromosome J that's considered, you know, air quotes, Semitic, 
is JP58. It's the main one seen in Arabs. But this doesn't mean all of Hap Group J is Afroasiatic and Semitic. The rest of the other branches of Hap Group J1 and J2 are overwhelmingly non-Semitic, but either Caucasian or Indo-European. JP58 is by far the most widespread subclade of J1. It is a tip it is a typical typically Semitic haplogroup, making up most of the population of the Arabian Peninsula, where it accounts for approximately 40 through 75% of male lineages. So JP58 is the one that's typically seen as Semitic. This is from EUpedia haplogroup J1. So here is P58, and as I said, it is only one subbranch out of a bunch of other subbranches. Here's other subbranches, but this one is seen as Semitic. Everything else is not seen as Semitic. And here's J2 as well. Don't forget about J2. So in the whole haplogroup group of J, only P58 is seen as Semitic. Everything else outside of that really isn't Semitic. Like it might have a few Semitic speakers here and there, but most of these other hap these other sub branches of J are uh, non Semitic speakers. So it kind of makes it difficult for you know the original Semitic population to come from half of J if it's only one branch that's seen as Semitic and everything else is non Semitic. And this is from EUpedia half of J1. Is JP58 the main Arabic paternal lineage? Looking at the map of J1-P58, it is easy to assume that P58 is a marker of Arabic ancestry because it reaches its maximum frequency in and around the Arabian Peninsula. That would be an oversimplification. It is important to make a clear distinction between people who speak Arabic and those who are genetically Arabic. These are two completely different things. For comparison, people who speak languages descended from Latin, such as French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Romanian, are not necessarily descendants from the ancient Romans of the Luthium, even those who do even those who do may not have more than a tiny fraction of their genome, which was inherited from actual Roman ancestors. This is why most Romance language speakers today cannot be considered as genetically Roman. The most, pre the most pre present day Arabic speakers outside of outside the Arabian Peninsula are likewise only very partially or not all Arabic genetically. In the northern half of the Middle East, most of the people who call themselves Arabs of today are in fact mainly descendants of other historic peoples such as the Phoenicians, Assyrians, Babylonians, or even, bing, 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 the Hurrians. Most of these people are predominantly J2, with many minority haplogroups like E1B1B, G, J1, L, Q, R1A, R1B, and T. So basically they're saying just because, you know, uh, the Raven Peninsula has a lot of J, and that a lot of the people with J in the Arabian Peninsula speak Arabic doesn't necessarily mean that Arabic originated with J or that J is the original Arab lineage. And so that's very important to know. Basically, they're saying that these people with J who today speak Arabic could descend from other ancient Middle Eastern populations like, and they mentioned, you know, the Hurrians, which we know for a fact, um, was a population of people uh, who this J marker is typically associated with. So continuing, it says, the other subclades of J1 cannot be considered to be the paternal descendants of first speakers of Arabic. Let me read that again. The other subclades of J1 cannot be considered to be the paternal descendants of first speakers of Arabic. These other J1 lineages are, were Arabicized alongside other haplogroups like, like J2 and Q1B, etc. So they were Arabicized. Like J1-P58, 
E dash M thirty four is it is also shared with their Semitic cousins, the Jews. Haplogroup E one B one B is considered the prime candidate for the origin and dispersal of Afro Asiatic languages across northern and eastern Africa and southwest Asia. The Semitic languages appear to have originated within a subclade of E thirty four branch of E one B one B. So half the group E is associated with Semitic. So half the group J people adopted Semitic from half the group E proto Semitic. And if these half group J carriers were Hurrians, then what were the Hurrians known for? Hurrians were known for adopting and assimilating into other people's cultures. This would include the Semites. This is how everything is starting to come together. Within a few centuries after the fall of Washakuna in Washakuna to Assyria, uh, Matani became fully Assyrianized and linguistically Aram Aramaicized, and use and use of the Hurrian language began to be discouraged throughout the Neo-Assyrian Empire. So when Assyria conquered the Mitanni and the Hurrians, they the Hurrians culturally and linguistically became Assyrian and became Aramaic. So technically you could have some Assyrian people and Ameri and Aramaic speaking people who descend from Hurrians. So that's very important to know. Uh, this is from World History Encyclopedia, Hurrians. It was likely that the Hurrian conquest of that region was a complex phenomenon, including peaceful migration, infiltration by mercenary bands in the pay of local city-states, followed by the rise of to power of mercenary warlords, culminating in the eventual full-scale migration of Hurrian herding tribes out of the mountains into the more fertile river valleys. So basically there's different ways that they could have came into the land. Warfare or peaceful, basically. Furthermore, the Hurrians often seem to have adopted the cultures of the city-states they conquered, making them less visible than ever in, in historical record. For example, we have no evidence of a distinctive Hurrian military system. It seems that if there ever were a people who were both everywhere and nowhere it was the Hurrians. So, you know, the Hurrians basically were, <laughs> as they just said, they were everywhere but nowhere. Like it was, you can find them everywhere in history, but, but you know, it was also difficult to see them because they also always assimilated people's cultures. That's why it's difficult to find them because they were assimilating too much and adopting too much. Uh, this is from the Cambridge uh, Ancient History, and it reads, the Hurrians, it is true, showed a marked capacity for assimilating the cultural values of the more advanced peoples with whom they came into contact. And this, you know, would include Semites. If they came into contact with Semites, they would adopt Semitic culture. Remember, these Hurrians had half the group J. So we actually do have an ethnic group with half the group J that we know for a fact adopted and assimilated into other cultures. Which leads to my next point. The fact that there are two different peoples living in the Middle East from an even deeper genetic level, autosomal DNA and STR markers. Genetically and phenotypically, we have Irano Caucasians and Natufian Afrasans. Historically, we know that Indo European and Caucasian populations penetrated the northern part of the Middle East and created multiple civilizations, whereas Semites were more indigenous to the southern parts of the Middle East, coming from the Levant and their ancestors being Natufians. This is from the peoples of the highland uh, vanished cultures of Larstan, uh, Manani, and Uratu, and it reads, during the second millennium, the long process began by which Indo-European peoples from the northern steppes beyond the Caucasus established themselves 
about Western Asia, Iran, and Northern India. Their earliest pressure perhaps drove some of the native peoples of the mountains to migrate or infiltrate and sometimes come as invaders into Mesopotamia and northern Syria, even in the third millennium. The Indo-Europeans then drove their way through these people, drawing many of them in their train as subjects or allies, and appeared and appeared themselves early in the second millennium as invaders and conquerors in the Near East. To the first half of the millennium, the Highlanders under Indo-European leadership dominated the older peoples of the plains, most of whom were Semites. So this is Indo-European Caucasian um, migration slash invasion, uh, conquering and dominating the peoples, the Semitic peoples who were in the plains and who were older and more indigenous. Two other peoples are directly uh, relevant, namely the Kassites, from whom the Zargos Mountains in the region of Laristan, and the Hurrians, who spread from regions further north, particularly from Armenia. Both were themselves native peoples of the highlands and spoke a language and spoke languages which were not Indo-European, but belonged to a group sometimes loosely called Caucasian, once widespread but later surviving only in the Caucasus. They were led by Indo-European aristocracies, small in number, but great in energy and achievement. They were the first to use the horse in war to draw the light chariot and spoked wheels. Indo-European names of gods at least appear among the Kassites, and of gods and rulers much more obviously among the Hurrians, in whom this element was clearly stronger. In most cases, the names reveal the Indic branch, or you know, the Indic, the Iranian, or the Indian branch of the uh, Indo-European family, of which the main body moved through Iran to conquer northern India. So basically, we see from this book is that um, the Hurrians and the Indo-Europeans seem to have traveled together a lot, and the Indo-Europeans, specifically the Iranian branch, seem to have been the the more ruling class, the more uh, Hierarchical, hierarchical class of uh, ruling over the uh, the Hurrians and uh, sort of sort of guiding guiding these uh, migrations and these uh, war tactics and such. So this is from In Hot Pursuit of Language and Prehistory. So we're going to contrast what we just read with who the ancestors of Semites are. And this paper this paper makes an additional inference since there is archaeological and physical anthropological reason to believe that the Natupians were related to modern Semitic-speaking peoples of the Levant. This is from Bayesian phylogenetic analysis of Semitic languages, identifies an early Bronze Age origin uh, of Semitic in the Near Eastern and reads, we estimate that Semitic had an early Bronze Age origin in the Levant, followed by an expansion of Akkadian into Mesopotamia. So, basically, complete polar opposites when it comes to these Hurrians and Indo-Europeans with their origins compared to the people and origins of Semites. Semites come from the Tupians, migrating from the Levant. Indo-Europeans and Hurrians come from the Pontic Steep and from the Caucasus and come south into the Middle East. Completely polar opposites. So, genetically, this is exactly what we see among modern populations the Irano-Caucasian genome, and the Natufian levantine genome. So the genomic history of the Middle East, uh, this paper, it reads, Arabians and Bedouins are positioned close to ancient Levantines, while present-day Levantines are drawn towards Bronze Age Europeans, Iraqi Arabs, Iraqi Kurds, and Assyrians appear closer to ancient Iranians. So modern-day you know, Arabians, Bedouins, they're closer to Natufians. Present-day Levantines, as well as uh, Arabs and Iraq, and Kurds in Iraq and Assyrians, they're closer to Bronze Age Europeans and ancient Iranians. And we just read from, you know, a historical source that these, <laughs> that these are ancient uh, Indo-European peoples that came into the Middle East, you know. 
and they went and conquered the peoples of the plains, the Semites, who would have been, you know, peoples descendant from the Tuvians. When we substitute Levant Neolithic with Natuvians as source of ancestry in the Middle East, we found that Arabians could be successfully modeled. So Arabians are very close to Natuvians. Whereas none, whereas none, whereas none of the present-day Levantines could be modeled as such. So present-day Levantines are not close to Natuvians. Model-based uh, clustering also showed that Arabian populations have have a substantially lower Anatolian Neolithic ancestry compared with present-day Levantines. We found an ancestry related to ancient Iranians that is ubiquitous today in all Middle Easterners. Previous studies show that this ancestry was not present in the Levant during the Neolithic period, which is around the time of the Tupians, but appeared in the Bronze Age where 50% of the local ancestry the descendants of the Tufians, were replaced by population carrying ancient Iranian related ancestry. This population potentially introduced the Y chromosome haplogroup J1 into the region. The haplogroup common in the Tufians, even B and B, is also frequent in our data set, with most lineages uh, being as old as you know 8.3 KYA. By modeling contemporary populations using ancient genomes, we identify differences between the Levant and Arabia. The Levant today has higher European slash Anatolian related ancestry. Let me read that again. The Levant today has higher European slash Anatolian related ancestry. People in the Levant today, you know, the Levant, Israel today, have higher European and Anatolian ancestry. While Arabia has higher African and Natufian like ancestries. So people in Arabia are more, in a sense, Afro-Asiatic. They have more African and Asiatic ancestry. It has been suggested that population discontinuity occurred between the late Pleistocene and early Heliocene in Arabia, and that the peninsula was repopulated by Neolithic farmers from the Fertile Crescent. In addition, our models suggest that Arabia could have derived their ancestry from Natufian-like local hunter-gatherer populations instead of Levantine farmers. So, people in Arabia and other groups related to Natufians seem to have retained the more original Semitic genome, whereas modern-day Middle Easterners in other parts of the Near East seem to have been more Caucasian or European in their genome. So, who are Natufian-related populations today? So here are the uh, Natufian related populations. Uh, people, the, the people in Arabia, as we said, they have the highest amount. So that would be people like in Yemen, as well as Bedouins, uh, certain Saudi tribes. And then you have people like Berbers, certain Northern African peoples like Tunisians and uh, Moroccans. You also have Palestinians and Bedouins and Jordanians and Samaritans that have high amounts. Uh, Mosbites and Algerians and Jewish populations uh, like Yemeni Jewish and you know Tunisian Jewish Libyan Jewish populations etc. So those are the people with the highest amount of haplogroup. I mean, excuse me, of Natufian ancestry, Levant Natufian. So what's interesting about that is that it kind of matches with the haplogroups as well. Um, this is dealing with haplogroup E, and here are the samples. When it comes to Arabs, a lot of them do have haplogroup E at 68%, Berbers at 88%, Sahrawi at 78%, uh, Arab again, uh, Berbers, uh, Moroccans, uh, just different populations of haplogroup E. And this, again, is the people, so it matches with the people. So let's specifically break this down. Let's look at Yemenite people, Yemenite population with uh, this high amount of uh, Natufian-related ancestry. So this matches with haplogroup E, the exact same populations that we see right here, appears right here, where people in Yemen have around 25% to 50% of haplogroup E. Here are the samples from where they got it from in Yemen. And here's just a map dealing with haplogroup E. You do see a high concentration in Arabia, and uh, ba basically on the western shore of the Red Sea of Arabia, 
Southern Arabia. So now it's still with people like Tunisians and Bedouins and Berbers and such and Moroccans. They also have high amounts of half of the fee. This, here's the name of the study at the top. And so here's half of the fee among Moroccan Arabs, one, two, and three, at around 70, uh, 72 to 75 percent. Uh, Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardic Jews as well have half of the E at 18 to 30 percent. Um, Berbers have E at about uh, 85 to 89 percent. And Algerians, Sahrawi, Tunisians, they have it around you know 82, 65 percent. And so these are people with high amounts of Natufian related ancestry. So let's look at Palestinians, Georgians, and Samaritans. Uh, Samaritans, they of course have high amounts of half of the fee, the priestly Kohenim lineage from the tribe of Levi. Uh, however, the biggest and most important, the most important Samaritan family, the Kohen family, tradition tribe of Levi, was found to belong to half of the fee. So they have uh, they have this E marker in Tufian related ancestry. Uh, Samaritan Levites have 100% half of the fee, 0% J. Uh, Arabs in Egypt. Have around 636% to 62% half of the Arabs in Palestine, 60, I'm mean, excuse me, 31%. Arabs in the Jordan, 31%. So the, and again, these are Natufian related people, people with high amounts of Natufian ancestry. Now let's look at Tunisians, Mozabites, Algerians, and Moroccans and such. So here are Berbers. They typically have up to 31% to 98% of Papal Group E uh, in Morocco and Berbers and Arabs in Morocco, they have around, you know, 50 to 70, 60 percent of Papal Group E. Arabs in Morocco and Berbers and such have around, you know, have around like 1 to 42 percent of Papal Group E. These are different subclades, by the way, so let me back up. Uh, e M30, you have E M81. Um, and then you have E M78. These are two different branches of E that's high. And then when it comes to the J, they have North Africa, there's very few populations with half of the J. It's very little in North Africa. So when it comes to Semitic ancestry, I believe that Natufian Levantine DNA is what I would consider to be Semitic ancestry, genetically speaking. So having that is an indicator of it, but also. We see that this Natufian related ancestry is quite high among uh, half of the E individuals as well. So most ethnic groups with Natufian related ancestry are Afroasiatic people. That's another thing that I know, noticed when looking at that. Most of the people, one, with this Natufian related ancestry are Afroasiatic, and many of these people also seem to have half of the E at high proportions. Again, this is why I say Natufians are the best bet for the ancestors of Afroasiatic and Semitic people. It's seen among those population of people, and it's seen, and they also have high amounts of fee. So here's a map just detailing everything. Here's the Afroasiatic language map. Here is the Natufian map, and here is the Haplogroup E map. It all matches one another. People with Natufian ancestry typically have Haplogroup E, and they're typically Afroasiatic speakers. Now, of course. You know, you can have people with half the group J with Natufian ancestry and other half the groups. I'm not going to deny that. We see it, but that's due to admixture. The original Natufians, as we all know, had half the group E. So it kind of makes sense that you're going to find people with half the group E with this Natufian ancestry as well. So here's everything put together in one chart. Here is the Levant Natufian. This is what I consider to be Semitic ancestry among all these Afroasiatic populations. And then here is the uh, people with or the same middle, Natufian ancestry with high amounts of half of the fee. This is why I believe Natufians is the best bet. Pretty good, pretty good bet. Here's just another map detailing it. Another map, this is Natufian using the Punt DNA, K, K12 ancient DNA. And it's a map just detailing it. And the Natufian ancestry is highest in the Middle East, which makes sense. And then it spans outward from the Middle East into uh, Africa and into other parts of the Middle East where we see Afro-Asiatic speakers. And here's just a map showing these Semitic languages. So it kind of 
everything kind of comes together. But genetically speaking, the other branch of Middle Easterners are Indo-Europeans and Caucasians. This is from European, well, this is from genetic evidence for an origin of the Armenians from Bronze Age mixing of multiple populations. And it reads, Armenians were found to have genetic affinity to other to, se to several other populations, including the Jews, Druze, and Lebanese Christians, in addition to showing genetic continuity with the Caucasus. We observe that Armenians form a distinctive cluster bound by Europeans, Near Easterners, and the Caucasus populations. More specifically, Armenians are close to Spaniards, Italians, and Romanians from Europe, Lebanese, Jews, Druze, and Cretans from the Near East, and Georgians and As, uh, Abkhazians from the Caucasus. We find in Armenians and other genetic isolates in the Near East high shared ancestry with ancient European farmers with ancestry proportions being similar to present-day Europeans but not to present-day Near Easterners. This result suggests that genetic isolates in the Near East, Cretans, and island population, Near Eastern Jews and Christians, religious isolates, and Armenians, ethno-linguistic isolate, probably retain the features of an ancient genetic landscape of the Near East that had more affinity to Europe than the present-day population do. Our tests show that most of the Near East genetic isolate ancestry that is shared with Europeans can be attributed to expansion after the Neolithic period. So again, many Middle Eastern populations are basically related to present-day Europeans and ancient Europeans. Armenians adopt the adoption of a distinctive culture early in their history resulted in their genetic isolation from their surrounding surroundings their, it, their genetic resemblance today to other genetic isolates in the Near East, but not to other, but not to most other Near Easterners, suggests that recent admixture has changed the genetic landscape in most populations in the region. Armenians' genetic diversity reveals that the most, that the ancient Near Eastern, excuse me, Armenians' genetic diversity reveals that the ancient Near East had higher affinity to Neolithic Europe than it does now, and that Bronze Age demographic processes had a major impact on the genetics of populations in the region. This is from the Genomic History of the Middle East. Present-day Levantines are drawn towards Bronze Age Europeans. Iraqi Arabs and Iraqi Kurds and Assyrians appear closer, relatively closer, to ancient Iranians. This is from HLA Alil's and haplotypes in the Turkish population, relatedness to Kurds, Armenians, and other Mediterraneans, and it reads, Turkish and Kurdish HLA profiles are attested for uh, the first time. A comparative study of their allele frequencies, characteristic haplotypes, uh, genetic distance with other me Mediterraneans is, com is uh, complemented by neighbor joining uh, dendrograms in correspondence analysis, Turks, Kurds, Armenians, Iranians, Jews, Lebanese, and other Eastern and Western Mediterranean groups seem to share a common ancestry, the older Mediterranean substratum. Anatolian Hittites and Hurrian groups older than 2000 BCE, these may have given rise to present-day Kurdish, Armenian, and Turkish populations. Turks Kurds within Turks cluster, excuse me, Turks cluster within the Eastern Mediterraneans, including Kurds and Armenians. Taking all taking all our different types of data analysis together, Turks, other Anatolians like Kurds and Armenians and Iranians appear as belonging to an older Mediterranean substratum included within the Eastern Mediterranean group. In summary, it seems that Turks, Kurds, and Armenians are very close genetically, and all of them seem to have been living in the area for millennia. This is from genetic HLA uh, studies of Kurds in Iraq, Iran, and Tbilisi, Caucasus, Georgia, where relatedness and medical implications. 
and reads. On the other hand, Kurd people live in different countries in the Near East, such as Syria, Armenia, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Turkey, Iraq, and Iran. The so-called Kurdistan, land of the Kurds. Kurdistan is a region placed south Caucasus and north of ancient Mesopotamia, according to genetic studies like HLA in, Kur in Turkish and Kurdish populations. A Anatolian Mediterranean source for both populations was put forward. It may be possible that Kurds are initially coming from ancient Hurrians, reviewed in the studies. The second cluster comprises Europeans, Mediterraneans, Caucasus, and Iranian populations. Iraq Kurds, Iran Kurds, and Georgia Kurds are lo located relatively close together. Here is a map, just or here is a tree showing that. Kurds from Iraq, Iran, and Georgia being close. Plain genetic distance DA genetic distance of show that Iraq Kurds genetic close gen, closest genetic distance are the following near eastern populations Iran Kurds Palestinians Fars Parsi Georgia Kurds and Ashkenazi Jews eastern Mediterranean populations Armenians Cretans and Macedonians and Mediterranean populations Sardinians Spaniards Algerians and Italians and then his chart is showing that. Our conclusions were that their HLA profile showed that Kurds form part of a Mediterranean stock of people and all, uh, and also had Caucasus genetic traits. Uh, Saving Georgians also, it is worth mentioning that Lac populations, East Caucasus area, may be close to both Lore and Kurd populations, and Lac name could be considered post, could be considered post. Uh, composed, excuse me, considered composed of lore incurred words. In the present paper, we have analyzed HLA genes in Kurds living in North Iraq, uh, com comparison with other population populations, place them as a Middle Eastern population, close to Kurds from Tbilisi, Georgia, Palestinians, Armenians, and Kurds from Iraq, from Iran. In both analysis, Kurds are also close to Caucasian, Slavin, uh, Georgian populations. Conclusion is that Kurds are genetically close to surrounding Caucasian and Mediterranean populations and that have remained settled down in Kurdistan since ancient times. Supporting historical evidence is reviewed in our previous work. HLA, HLA genetic similarity have been reported between Turks, whose genes belong to old Anatolian stock, and Kurds. Kurds and Turks speak languages that are that are included in different families. However, Kurd HLA genetic studies include them into Mediterranean stock together with Turks. Other genetic dis, other genetic studies based on Y chromosome in Kurds from Turkey, Georgia, and Iran identified the dominant presence of haplogroups originated in Middle East, Anatolia, or Mesopotamia that show a close association with Jews, Lebanese, and Turkish genes. Also, Iranian populations are close to Kurds. Thus, Middle East peoples from, Medi from, Mes from Medi Thus, Middle Eastern peoples from Mediterranean border and Kurds seem originally to belong to a sim similar ethnic group according to HLA autosomic and Y chromosome genes results. Kurds have always lived in the mountains be, uh, being autochthonous 6000 BC. Hurrians, whose language was Caucasian and not Indo-European, may be Kurds ancient genetic background reviewed in references. By 1200 BC, Medes and other, others invaded Hurrian area. In summary, all Three Kurd populations studied in this present paper are genetically genetically close together, and to other Mediterranean and Caucasus populations according to HLA genes. This is from human ancestry correlates with language and reveals that race is not an objective genomic cost, uh, classifier. West Asian ancestry correlates with Northeast Caucasian, Northwest Caucasian and Catavillian language families, as well as the Armenian branch of the Indo-European language family. 
To expound this point, West Asian ancestry uh, currently exists at its highest frequency in peoples from the Caucasus Mountains and the Levant, and is the and is the major ancestry in as Caucasian, Georgian, and Druze samples. Eight, the correlation of West Asian ancestry with North East Caucasian, Northwest Caucasian, and Kabylian languages is consistent with the philolinguistic hypothesis that these three groups of languages are related in a larger grouping called Ibero-Caucasian. This is from Parallel Evolution of Genes and Languages in the Caucasus Region. Combining genetic and linguistic findings, we now propose a model of the evolution of Caucasus populations. The final tree was obtained by merging the genetic clusters with the back with the background linguistic tree. We concluded that the Caucasus gene pool originated from a subset of the Near Eastern gene of the Near Eastern pool due to an upper Paleolithic or Neolithic migration, followed by significant genetic drift, possibly due to isolation in the extreme mountainous landscape. And so basically, basically with everything that I just read, that one paper summed everything up perfectly. Middle Eastern populations, they are basically a subset of Caucasians that migrate into the Middle East. And Middle Easterners are also a subset of Europeans that migrated into the Middle East. This is why Near Easterners have such close relatedness to Caucasian and Europeans. And this is why, basically, as you can see in this chart, Near Easterners are set right in between, dead set right in between Europeans and Caucasians. And there's really nothing Afroasiatic or Semitic about Indo-Europeans and purebred Caucasians. This is why many, I say many Near Easterners are not Semitic in origin, at least those with the, uh, the J marker. But again, Near Easterners are basically just a subgroup of Caucasians or a subgroup of Europeans. And this is why they're dead set in the middle genetically when it comes to it. So we see that modern Middle Easterners are essentially a branch of Indo-European Iranians, Hittites, Mitanni, or Kassites, etc., and that modern Middle Easterners are a sub-branch of Caucasians, Hurrians, and Hurrians that would have been among the Hittites, the Mitanni, and the Kassites, and other groups. And we also now understand that many Middle Eastern groups that we say are called Semitic are related to non-Semitic Middle Eastern groups. Again, many Middle Eastern people today that we call Semitic are related to non-Semitic people. We, act, we actually find people with the same gen genome of a quote-unquote Semitic speaker in the Middle East that is related to someone, to a whole group of people who aren't Semitic speakers. So, but we know for, we, but we know the reason for this now, that Indo-Europeans and Caucasian populations migrated into Semitic lands when those empires fell and adopted the culture of Semites. This is why you have one group of people with the exact same genome of a Semitic speaker speaking the Indo-European language, and another person who is a Semitic speaker with the genome of the Indo-European speaker. Thus, you have Middle Easterners today that speak Semitic languages and others that speak Indo-European languages or Caucasian languages, but they are all genetically the same. Middle Easterners with half the J are technically Irano-Caucasian. Basically, in the Middle East, as stated before, you have Natufian Afrasan proto-Semites with half the group E and Irano-Caucasian Armenoids with half the group J. But phenotypically, you see that these people as, as, as well, you can kind of tell by looking that you can kind of see that there's a contrast of two different peoples. In ancient times, such as the early Bronze Age, Semites would have been much darker if Semites descended from the Natufians because they were dark. People with the highest Natufian ancestry today are the Arabians and Bedouins who are also quite dark. Again, since there is archaeological and physical anthropological reason to believe that the Natufians were related to modern-day Semitic-speaking peoples of the Levant. Uh, this is from the questionable contribution of the Neolithic 
and the Bronze Age to European cranio craniofacial form in the reeds. It is a further surprise that the Epipaleolithic Natufian of Israel, from whom the Neolithic realm was assumed to arise, has a clear link to Sub Saharan Africa. If the late Pleistocene Natufian sample of, from Israel is the source from which that Neolithic spread was derived, then there was clearly a Sub Saharan African element present of almost equal importance as the late prehistoric Eurasian element. So here's a reconstruction of the Natufian. And I'll say that everything is correct about this reconstruction other than the hair. I believe that that hair will be a bit more curly. I mean, after all, you can find Middle Easterners with afros and thick, bushy hair. So I think the hair is off. But the skin tone and everything else is on point, I would say. The genomic history of the Middle East. Arabians and Bedouins are positioned close to ancient Levantines. Remember that Arabians and Bedouins are closest to these Natufians. Uh, cu curiously, ancestral E-star lineages have been detected in the Arabian Peninsula and the Levant. That's from carriers of mitochondrial DNA, micro haplogroup L3, basal lineage, lineages migrated back to Africa from Asia around 70,000 years ago. So again, uh, it would seem as though that the Bedouins and that the Yemenites, you know, Arabians and Bedouins, have this high amount of uh, Natufian-related ancestry, as we can see right here. And we see that when it comes to Yemenites and uh, Bedouins and such, that they do have around 25 to 50% of haplogroup E. And here's another chart showing that. You see this hot percentage of E in... Uh, or, um, or, or Yemen and uh, in other parts of Arabia where the Bedouins would be situated in those deserts. And so again, here's a map. The highest concentration of Natufian DNA is in the Middle East and it expands outward. This is also where you see Semitic languages. And so here are Arabian, Bedouin, Yemeni people. These typically are darker skinned people. And so now let's contrast this with haplogroup J, its origin in people in early regions. So this is from Upper Paleolithic Genome, reveals deep roots of modern Eurasians and Reeds. Both Georgian hunter-gatherers samples were associated with J, with haplogroup J, with Katos belonging to the sub-haplogroup J to A. In a study exploring J haplogroups in 400. 45 individuals from Eurasia, J2A was found at high highest frequency in Georgia and Iraq. It is intriguing that both the mitochondrial and Y chromosome haplogroups of our ancient Georgian samples have been associated with the neolithization of Europe. This tensive, this uh, attentively uh, suggests a genetic link between Georgian hunter-gatherers and early European uh, early European migrants from the Near East. So we see that half of J is associated with ancient Georgian, Caucasian hunter-gatherers, and uh, it even has association with early European migrants. Now, to explore further, we looked at the genome types and two pigmentation genes supposed to have been strongly selected in the ancestors of modern Europeans, namely SLC45A2 and SLC24A5, selected SNPs and the S. SLC45A2 and SLC24A5 genes contributed to lightening of skin and are also almost fixed in modern Europeans. We found that Katos and Serbia have the ancestral version of the SLC45A2 variant, but both caucus hunter-gatherers have the select version of the SLC24A5 gene encompassed by the most by the most commonly associated haplotype C11 found in modern populations. So we see haplogroup J, caucus hunter gatherers are also associated with the early uh, peoples with light skin. So here are, by the way, uh, Yanaya people who derive half of their ancestry from caucus hunter gatherers. And just reading this source, the 
to just remind ourselves of, of the place that we're dealing with and the people. The Northeast Caucasian language family seems to show clear links to ancient Eastern Anatolia, as most subplates of J1-Z1842 can be linked to the Armenian highlands and present-day Azerbaijan, precisely fitting the exact location of the core of Raxus culture. Three subclades of it, J1-ZS3042, J1-ZS5658, J1-ZS2872, and J1-Y5353 are widespread among Northeast Caucasian groups, suggesting Northeast Caucasian languages to have originated from the core of Raxus culture as ancient J1 subclades also seem to have been present in the ancient Levant as well. This supports the existence of the Alduin language family linking Horian to Northeast Caucasian. So it's uh, half the J's linked to early Caucasian languages. And also when it comes to the phenotype, short headed and long skull type with fleshy features, a flat occiput and a hooked nose, Op often uh, black haired with light brown skin, common in the mountainous regions of Asia Minor, especially Armenia and Anatolia, found in ancient uh, Sumerians, Babylonians, like the Kassites, Hittites, and Cretans around 4000 BCE. So we're dealing with the, the, these people, these early J marker people would have had this type of phenotype. And so this is from parallel evolution of genes and lineages in the regions, of, in the Caucasus region. It reads, again, haplogroup J to A, 4B M67 uh, comprise 51 through 79% of the Y chromosome in the English and three Chechnyan populations, Northeast Caucasus Nat linguistic group. Finally, haplogroup J1 M267 comprise 44 through 99% of the Southeast Caucasus Dangestan linguistic group. So basically, Nat Dangestan. Combining a linguistic and ling genetic and linguistic findings, we now compose a model of the evolution of Caucasus populations. The final tree was obtained by merging the genetic distance with the background linguistic tree. We conclude that the Caucasus gene pool originated from a subset of Near East pool due to the Upper Paleolithic or Neolithic migrations, followed by significant, significant genetic drift possibly due to isolation in the extreme mountainous landscape. So here are, you know, Caucasians, Nat Dangestan peoples. Basically, uh, you're seeing Chechnyan and English people. These are people with, you know, highest amounts of half of J, as we just read. This is what they look like. So in both ancient and modern times, you see two basic stocks of people. Um, you see a more irano caucasian phenotype Arminoid and a more Natuvian phenotype, um, the brown you're African. Uh, and this report actually d details that reports on the human remains found at Kish. It would appear that it, it would appear then that we have at least two groups of two groups in the Near East: one dolichocephalic, and the other round-headed, and that. Although some members of both groups have remained a mix, others have mingled considerably as so as to form some of the most mixed races in the world. The basal types are the brown your African group, and the basal meaning the more ancient types is the brown your African group of your Semites, and the Arminoid group. There are, however, striking differences from the types found at Kish. There the dolichocephals are chiefly represented by the Eurafrican type. In the Near East, this type, although it occurs, is comparatively rare. The more common type being the brown Mediterranean variety, closely akin to Elliot Smith's Proto-Egyptians. As far west as Crete, they form in early times the majority of the population, but to the east, but to the eastward, they are, on the whole, dominated by the round-headed arminoid. The history of the Near East seems to suggest that there was a gradual infiltration of the latter type, probably interior to the copper or early bronze or bronze age. So just to reread what the arminoid type is, 
The so-called Amalekite type is defined by Hayden under the Eurasiatic Rhodocephalus as Anatolian Armenian, dark hair, tawny white skin, medium stature, very brachiocephalic, a prominent aquiline nose, hook nose with a depressed tip and large wings, very characteristic, is very characteristic. Scattered in Anatolia, Armenia, the ancient Hittites were typical members of this race. Now let's contrast this with the brown New African. Uh, particularly when we note once more that Mediterranean is not a synonym for white, Elliot Smith's brown or Mediterranean race being nearer the mark, Elliot Smith classes these proto-Egyptians as a branch of what he calls the brown race, which is the same as Sergi's brown, excuse me, which is the same as Sergi's Mediterranean or Eurafrican race. The term brown in this context refers to skin color and is simply a euphemism for Negro. So this is a picture in the middle of a from ancient Mari, Akkadian Semitic city. And then you have a, just an image that I feel like of two people who kind of match the phenotype. And then down below are uh, Arabians and Bedouins who also match the phenotype of these people, these ancient Semites of Mari. So we see, again, contrasts of different peoples in the Middle East, different phenotypes in the ancient Middle East and modern Middle East. Like these people are just as much of Middle Easterners as the lighter skinned people that I showed earlier and vice versa. And then here again, here are ancient Hittites. Here are modern Middle Easterners like uh, Armenians and uh, 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 Kurdish people and such. So again, you have two Middle Eastern types. Here are ancient Hittites with their phenotype, and here are modern-day Middle Easterners. Here are ancient Akkadian Semites with their phenotype, and here are modern-day Middle Easterners. Again, phenotypically, we can even see that there are two types of people in the Middle East. That's why I always find it interesting when people say, well, again, I'm just going to use Jesus as an example, or Abraham. They say, oh, he looked, they, you know, look Middle Eastern. Um, but it's like, okay, so by Middle Eastern, which phenotype are you choosing? Are you choosing the more armenoid, lighter skin phenotype, or are you choosing the more darker skinned Arabian phenotype? You know, because you can't just say Middle Eastern. That's a very general term for a large geographical area of different looking peoples. You know, but uh, from all the information that I've gathered, I would say that the Semites would have been this more darker skin type compared to the lighter skin type, which is more Indo-European and Caucasian. And again, here's just various here are ancient Sabaeans and Ethiopians who are believed to be a Ethiosemitic people. You have the ancient um, Elamites or Elamites, as some people might say. These people are supposed to descend from Shem, for a first son Elam. And then you have just Semites from Mari, Syria, Akkadians, and then you just have Arabians. So this to me is the general phenotype of ancient Semites and modern Semites. This is what I would kind of think of, of the indigenous, original, Middle Eastern, Afroasiatic, Semitic speaking population. They, just look, they look like this versus the more uh, proto-Caucasian, ancient European populations that looked more like this with these images of people that you see. And again, this again just shows that when you say ancient Middle East, you've got different peoples. You've got various groups living here that look completely different and genetically we do see that there is difference so so you know as we can see there are two middle eastern types of people the ancient semitic type seems to have been more darker the brown new african back then the darker skin types likely would have carried half of group e if they descended from the tupians and then you have the hurrian slash indo-european types with more irano caucasian armenoid features and the light skin type would have carried half of the J and they were descended from Caucasus hunter gatherers and uh, basically you know in in genotype and in phenotype we can kind of see two middle eastern people so just, as you can see below you have half of group E and half of group J they're both present in the middle east and they both do overlap one another that's another interesting thing they both overlap one another and uh when it comes to phenotype, you also see two, two different peoples as well, more darker skinned peoples and more lighter skinned peoples. So, yeah, just
just keep all this in mind when dealing with the ancient Middle East. There is nuance. There is diversity. But that being said, you can have, I want to make this clear, by the way, very, very clear. With that being said, you can find light-skinned people with capital E. Again, I'm going to repeat that. You can indeed find light-skinned people with capital E. And you can find dark-skinned people with capital J. You absolutely can find a dark-skinned person with capital J, both in the Middle East. Again, you can find light-skinned people with E and dark-skinned people with J, both in the Middle East and outside of the Middle East for that matter. But I believe that this is just further evidence of mixing since ancient times, since you can find uh, both peoples with um, different skin tones today. Uh, and, you know, you can find a family of people with E markers and J markers within the same family. I know a Yemenite Jew who is half group E, but he has relatives who are half the group J. And he even has a relative who has half the group A, but that's a whole nother thing. But anyways, you can find people with J and E within the same family in the Middle East as well. So that's just further evidence of mixing between the two peoples. But this is where we end two Middle Eastern types, Proto-Semitic Afrasan or Haplogroup E versus the Irano-Caucasian Armenoid Haplogroup J. Two Middle Eastern types. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like. Don't forget to subscribe and share the video. Click the bell. Leave a comment for any questions you might have. And follow my social media platforms for more information. And with all of that out of the way, have a great day and Shalom.